Is it silly to believe in Jesus the Christ? Reza Aslan is a man who was a believer and yet became at one point convinced in his own mind that Christianity is simply not logical. A new movement in the religious world is to say, okay, okay, we're going to give up on this whole notion of Jesus being Son of God, of Jesus being truly divine, but we can still hang on to Jesus being a really, really good guy. If Jesus was a really, really good guy, then how come he lied so much? Because he said he was the Son of God. Well, now, the way folks like Reza Aslan would deal with that is they'd say, no, 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 Jesus never said that. It's those guys that wrote about him that said that. And they made that stuff up later. I was flipping pages faster and faster as I'm reading some of the best historical research I've read in years about the life of Jesus. But in every page, I'm also seeing him say, and this is why you don't have to believe that he's the Son of God. I reopen the book to the first paragraph and the first sentence of the book. It is a miracle that we know anything about Jesus of Nazareth. Have you ever had somebody show you something that, that you've, you, you think you've seen, but then you realize when it's put in front of you, you've never seen it? How many of you know that there are two men holding a chip over a salsa bowl? How many here have ever seen a bag of Tostitos before? How many had never seen the two men holding the chip over the toasty? Exactly! Here's the question. You want to write it down? I promise you it will be useful. What if Jesus had actually been the Son of God? I sat down on a plane, and a fellow next to me glanced over at my Bible, and he leaned over and said, It's over. The day of Jesus has come and gone. And I said, So where are you from? He said, San Francisco. I said, Why is there a San Francisco? Can I tell you? He said, Sure. I said, because there was a gentleman named Francis who was extremely wealthy, but was so moved and so impacted by a man named Jesus Christ that he gave up all he had. And because of his following Jesus, he so impacted the world that they decided to name the city where you were born San Francisco for St. Francis. I said, you're kidding me. I said, no. You ever travel in California? Sure, I was born there. You ever been to San Jose? Why is there a San Jose? I don't know. I said, well, it comes from St. Joe. Do you realize there was a man named Joseph whose life intersected with you? And we just worked our way down the state. Santa Barbara, San Diego. What about Los Angeles? It's the city of the angels. It was named for people who believed in Jesus, who wanted angelic forces to be here. And he was backing up. Finally, he said, Sacramento. I said, I'm so glad you asked. Sacramento comes from the word for sacrament. Sacrament is the word that is used to describe the holy meal that Jesus put in place when the last night of his disciples, the capital of your state, is named after the communion that we take every week that reminds us that there was a Jesus who died, buried, resurrected, and gave himself for us. All right, I didn't say it that loud, okay? And he said, wow, I never thought about that. It's the Tostito bag. I'm going to give you, have you got, did you bring your right hand with you? Good. Just get it out. I'm, I'm going to give you five things you can remember with your fingers. So here we go. All right. Number one, everybody put your thumb up. And I want you to think of your thumb as the kid who likes history. And you look at your thumb, everybody say the word history. Jesus Christ changed the way we think about history. Now, progress is the way you and I were raised to think of time. Because in every history class, some enterprising teacher would put something up along one wall, and it had hash marks on it and numbers, and we called it a timeline. Question in the back, who invented the timeline? It's always been this way. Eh, wrong. In Jesus' day, time was counted as a circle. And every time you got a new Caesar, you'd have this circular way of thinking about time. Then comes Jesus, and Jesus says, can I tell you something about time? There was a beginning. There is a middle. There will come an end. If you look this up, Athean historians will tell you that the notion of progress, the notion of the movement across time, came from Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us the notion that history is heading somewhere. When John in the book of Revelation writes this, he says, Jesus is the Lord of lords and the ruler of rulers. Here's a bet. Let's see if you'd have taken it. Who's going to be more influential throughout history, 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire or Jesus Christ? 2,000 years later, we name our kids Matthew, 
Mark, Luke, John, and we name our dogs Caesar and Nero. (laughs) Paul said in the book of Philippians, every knee would bow. Well, they have. Every ruler, every nation is dated in reference to the life of Jesus Christ, the carpenter. It's the Tostito bag. It's right there in front of us. Number one, we think about the way that he changed history. Number two, put your finger up like this. I want you to think of a teacher teaching you, okay, you know, wagging the finger at you. And I want you to think of the way he impacted education and learning. I want to ask you why you even think we have school days and that children should be in school. Jesus. Teaching in the sense of formal education in the world in which Jesus grew up was not for everyone. Education was basically for the male children of wealthy and elite families. But guess who it was that said people need to be taught? It was the believers. Why were believers so committed through the years on people being educated? Because we need to teach them about Jesus. And in order to teach them about Jesus, they've got to be able to do things like read and understand. You go to Boston and you find out that the first schools in America were schools for poor children on one day of the week. And they were called... Sunday school. And it was Sunday school that developed into public education in this country. Anybody want to guess where Oxford and Cambridge came from? The University of Paris in the 12th century. They were started by Jesus followers who were committed to the belief that people need to be taught. Oxford motto from its founding, the Lord is my light. 92% of all colleges and universities started in this country before the Civil War, Civil War, 92% were founded in the name of Jesus Christ. The Reformation brought the notion that everyone should be able to read. Why? Because people saw Jesus and knew that learning was important. We look back to Jesus because he is the single most influential person in expanding and increasing education 2,000 years ago when he said, you teach them. One more. He changed how we offer compassion. Everybody say compassion. So, so far we've got, what's this first one? History. And then we've got education. And now we've got compassion. James, in James chapter 1, verse 27, the brother of Jesus wrote, Pure religion is this, to care for the orphans and the widows. You may not know that it was not common in Jesus' day to care for the weak. Know that I am still in Alexandria. I ask and beg you to take good care of our baby son. And as soon as I've received payment, I shall send it up to you. If you are delivered before I come home. If it is a boy, keep it. If a girl, discard it. They took the girl babies out to the edge of town, and they laid them on the trash heap. People were sneaking out and rescuing these babies. Guess who they were? They were people who believed in a Jesus who said, Suffer the little children and let them come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And as you've done to one of the least of these, you've done unto me. And so they brought those babies home, and they said to those babies, I'm going to be your God-parent. And the monks at the cathedrals, they began to build extra rooms were for these poor children, and they were the first orphanages built by believers take widows. They were seen as a problem and a drain on society. It was the followers of Jesus who said pure religion is to care for the orphans and the widows. During the first three centuries of the church, there were two major epidemics that decimated up to a third of the world's population. Guess who it was who went out and began to take in the sick and the dying? Why did they do it? Christians should demonstrate hospitality. So they built rooms and they called them hospitals. Do you ever wonder where the first hospitals came from? It wasn't a government program. Why do you think we have so many hospitals called St. Jude's, St. Ad, Presbyterian Memorial, Baptist Memorial? The reason they're named that is because they stand in a legacy of Christians who said, because of what Jesus taught me, I can't walk by the sick, I can't walk by the orphans, I can't walk by the disabled, I can't walk by the weak, because Jesus says, as you've done to these, you've done to me. When the disciples were dealing with some unbelieving Jews, at these words the Jews were again divided and many of them said, He's demon-possessed and raving mad. Can you read these four words with me? Why listen? That's what we're answering this morning. Why should a world that may think Jesus is just mad listen to him? Never before has a generation had more access to the truth about Jesus 
Christ. But never before has there been more skepticism and confusion about Jesus Christ. Isn't that odd? This generation can Google more information about Jesus than Bible professors in past generations could have possibly ever read. And it goes on and on. If you sat down at your computer and simply Googled Jesus Christ in history, you would have over 300,000 pages, computer pages, of information. And many of those pages aren't page size like you think of it. Some of the pages would take you an hour or more to begin to plow through. You do not have enough time in your life if you determine to read every blog, every post, every study piece that's written on Jesus Christ out there. Now you say, well, okay, so what? Why is this so? Someone says, you're stupid to believe in Jesus anymore. Time out. Then I need you to tell me, why is it that Jesus is the most written about, painted, sung about, studied about person in all of human history? Yaroslav Pelikan, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. It is from his birth that most of the human race dates his calendars. It is by his name that millions curse and in his name that millions pray. I was intrigued to find out that Jesus is still one of the most popular curse words among atheists. You just got to ask, don't you? Nobody shouts, Muhammad. They just don't do that. <laughs> they don't yell, Confucius. But boy, howdy, isn't it interesting how Christ's name, even by those who don't believe in him, slips so quickly off their lips and sometimes, forgive us, even ours, Lord, when we're upset. All right, let's get to the fourth one. And for the fourth one, I'm going to ask you to, to kind of put a little pinky down like this, all right? And, and when you put your pinky down like this, I'm hoping that you feel artistic, all right? Okay? Because that's what the fourth one is. That fourth finger is how Jesus impacted the arts in the world, all right? Let's review quickly. This one is? History. Say it out loud. History. And then? History. And then? History. And then? History. Very good. What about the arts? There's some great movies that have been released since The Passion of Christ. More and more of them. Christian filmmakers are getting better. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of those early early films, you went and you took your friends, you're so excited, and you went... Oh, boy. (laughs) You know. And some of your friends kind of giggled and said, oh, give me a break. All right. We somehow made the decision that the arts belong to the devil. And so we folded our arms and we just talked to one another about Jesus. But then folks like Mel Gibson and others said, wait a minute, The Ten Commandments was a pretty good movie in its day. Why don't we begin to tell the story of Jesus in the language of this culture? Because the more it happens, the more these young Christian filmmakers and older Christian filmmakers are going to produce better and better films. I guess what I'm saying is, let's give them a hand up. Let's not smack them in the face because they're not all of a sudden Steven Spielberg. Can I get an oh yeah on that? Okay, all right, thank you. I appreciate that. If you put a huge magnet above any of the great museums in the world and punched a button and made it pull up every piece of painted or sculpted art that was in any way influenced by Jesus Christ. Any that had his image in it, any that had a cross in it, any that had a church cathedral in it, any of the many, many images of Mary or of the disciples or of biblical scenes, any of the images that had to do with the bishops or the cardinals, if you yanked all of the Jesus-influenced art out of those museums, one writer said that many of them would lose up to three-fourths of their great art. Why? Because Jesus has influenced art more than any human to ever walk the planet. 
Why should I believe in Jesus? When it comes to the written word, wow, can you imagine losing Dante's Divine Comedy, which influenced almost subsequent Italian literature, or Luther's German Bible, which shaped the German language, or the King James Bible, which along with Shakespeare shaped the English language. From Pilgrim's Progress to the Shack, the pages written about Jesus are more pages in history about any single person, including Elvis, Hitler, and Lincoln combined. They don't even come close. Praise God that Jesus so impacted our world that people just couldn't stop writing about him. And music? Oh, my goodness. Think of the countless pieces of great music that shape the way we think about music. Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, Bach's Ode to Joy, Mozart's Requiem, Justin Bieber's Christmas album. I mean, over and over and over again. Sculpture, drama, poetry. Jesus has inspired more amazing, lasting global art than anyone. And if you came here from another planet and just looked at the historical evidence of art through the ages, the first question you'd ask after that review is, who is Jesus? (laughs) Because your data would tell you he is not like everyone else. And the whole church said? All right. Open your hand. Reach down, and I want you to lift up somebody, and I want to talk about human rights and dignity. Here we go. (sighs) Slavery, prejudice, cruelty to people whose views or whose skin color is different from yours is something that every person in this room grew up assuming Anybody with any sense knows that's the right way to live. Here there is no Greek or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, Colossians 3, 9 through 11. But in Christ, we are all together. We are all one in Christ. In America, we say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created Yeah, really, self-evident. Attila the Hun did not consider those truths to be self-evident. Genghis Khan did not consider those truths to be self-evident. Slaves traders in Europe and in America did not seem to consider those truths to be self-evident. But Jesus did. And Jesus was willing to teach about the good Samaritan when others would sneer. And Jesus' people through the years have been the ones that have marched and have protested and have said abolition will happen. That was led by Christians. Women's rights were led by believers. Children's rights were championed by Christians. And that's why preachers and Jesus followers were at the head of most of the civil rights parades. And when Martin Luther King departed from his script on that famous day standing in front of the Lincoln statue... And by the way, if you have not done so, go to the Lincoln Memorial and turn right from his statue and read the engraved words on the wall where Lincoln speaks of his faith and of God and of how the Lord influenced him. We have a nation whose very ethos was driven by the teachings of Jesus. Silly to believe in Christ? You're swimming in his influence. When Martin Luther stood there and began to say, let justice roll like a river, guess whose vision he was talking about? I have a dream. Mahalia Jackson, if you listen, you can hear her. Call out from the chorus. Tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And Martin begins to give this vision of a colorblind world where it is not your skin, but the quality of your character. Do you know whose dream he was speaking? Jesus Christ. Let's see if you can remember. We talked about the way Jesus impacted history. We talked about the way Jesus impacted... We talked about the way Jesus impacted compassion and philanthropy. We talked about the way Jesus impacted art world. And finally, we talked about the way Jesus impacted human dignity, human rights, civil rights. You can use all that language because Jesus stepped in. Second, is it stupid to still believe... In the Bible. Now, no, gen- I remember when my dad first got a copy of the New International Version. 
the NIV. Anybody remember the first time you picked up an NIV and you felt a little guilty, didn't you? (laughs) Just a tad. Because it didn't sound like God. God speaks Shakespearean English, I thought, (laughs) growing up. Because every verse I'd ever heard had these and thou's and goest and doest and saith. But then we began to get translations that, as I became old enough to understand it, were actually better. I'm not knocking those guys who gave us the King James Version of the Bible, but I am saying there have been a few archaeological discoveries since then, and today you can do work in Greek and in Hebrew all around the world at the same time on the Internet. But soon we had the New International Version before that, the Revised Standard Version, the New American Version, the New King James Version. And today, for no money at all, you can on your phone get 28 translations of the Bible completely free. The Bible is being more and more left on the shelf. And some of us are even making it more difficult for people. I need to confess that at times I have made fun of and given a hard time to some of our young people who use electronic versions of the Bible. I still remember the guy who went to a conference with one of his elders and the leader got up. He said, hey, everybody get your cell phones out. We all knew what he's going to try and do, get the teens to turn them off so they'd pay attention. He said, please turn your cell phones on and if you hear me say anything good about Jesus, text it to 10 of your friends. He'd made it a holy video game. I mean, they were waiting to see how fast they could text it to 10 friends. Since then, there's been many opportunities I've had to challenge teens to text the text to one another, to text a verse of Scripture. Many of you had get regular emails or text, and now it's Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. All right, folks, we who are used to a Bible looking like this had better start encouraging those that are using a Bible, and I've left my cell phone back there, otherwise it'd ring, that looks like that. If you don't have a Bible on your cell phone, get one. It's free. You say, why? Well, now be prepared for this. This item is actually a barrier to some in our culture. When one of my young sons wanted me to get him a Bible, I bought him a cool blue brown one, one that looked like denim. And he said, Dad, didn't they have any like adult Bibles? (laughs) I bought him a black one, but within a year and a half, he had his Bible in his palm, in his backpack, in his pocket, on his iPad, on his iTouch. Today, some people see this and they think history museum. They think like you and I think when we see in... You ever gone up Lancaster to see the Amish? You know what I'm talking about? The folks that don't use any kind of automotive, you know, so they've got the beards and the homemade clothes and they come along in their buggies. And we all go up there, wow, get a picture of that. That's so cool. Be prepared for kids to come up and say, ooh, can I have a picture of you holding that book? (laughs) But brothers and sisters, can you understand that we must remind the world that the Bible is not an old, dusty relic, but it is a living, active document that speaks to today through the power of the Holy Spirit who is still alive and active. Can I get a, oh yeah. All right, so... Somebody says, fine, fine, we'll get it on our iPads and we'll get it on our phones, Jeff, but here's the deal. Why should they believe it? Read this with me. May I ask the ladies to read the white and the men to read the yellow? Here we go. Ladies, when you received the word of God, we which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is ever heard in you. Amen. Now, folks, I used to simply turn to a passage like that and say, that's why you believe the Bible's God's word. Because the Bible says so. 
Now, let's have our Bible study. And, 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 and people will, oh, well, well, okay, I guess if, if the Bible says so. But more and more in a, de- in a generation that says you can't believe hardly anything you see because you can Photoshop anything. Are you with me on that? So someone says, well, well how can I, if, Jeff, if you're telling me that I, I can't simply say here the Bible says it's God's word, believe it. Well, let's do the same game that we did with Jesus. You ready? With Jesus, we said, what if Jesus had actually been the son of God? So with the Bible, we'd say, you don't believe it, but what if this really were God's book, God's word? Now, hear me. It is in the words of men. It is translated into English. I never want to tell somebody that what I'm holding in my hand is exactly word for word what Moses or what Paul wrote. We do have, I believe, solid evidence to say that God has walked this through history. And I'm not even going to take time to talk about all the translations evidence there are of the solidity of God's word. That when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they found that here was a gap of a couple thousand years and yet there was absolute connection. Oh yes, small small differences, but no major differences, which tells you that God's word was being faithfully handled and copied. I believe this is God's word to us. The words of men, but God's word to us. I believe it. But you don't. So let me ask this question. If this was God's word, what would you expect? Well, I guess first, if God wrote a book, it would have extremely unique stuff. I would say unexplainable stuff in it. Is there unexplainable stuff in the Bible? Well, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. Dr. Dale Manor serves at uh, Harding University. And he told me one of the most wonderful stories that has been so helpful. It comes from 2 Kings 2020. He said, Jeff, I wonder if you ever read this verse. And I said, well, look, I've read through the whole Bible, but I don't know if I've ever studied this verse. He said, you don't need to study it, just read it. So help me read this here. When I get to the yellow, you read it. As for the other events of Hezekiah's reign, all his achievements and how he made the pool and the tunnel by which... And Dale said, do you know how archaeologists go looking for stuff? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, how do you find something, something biblical? He said, you start by looking in here. And then you go dig in the ground to see if what's in here is in there. Now, you can't fake that. Somebody says, oh, the Bible's just a bunch of, of fairy tales. All that Old Testament stuff, you can't even believe it. Well, for years, archaeologists had been looking for the tunnel into Jerusalem that was supposedly built by Hezekiah. And no one had been able to find it. And skeptics were laughing and saying, when are you guys just going to give up? Until one day, they were working in a dig, and someone cracked through a sidewall, and they found Hezekiah's tunnel. If you go to the Holy Land one day, you can stand in that tunnel. When somebody tells you, oh, the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales, you need to remind them, no, actually, it's not. Uh, Luke 11, 32 through 34 is a scripture I know you've read and used in your devotionals many, many times about unclean things. It's It's about an unclean item like a little lizard. When one of them dies and falls on something, that article, whatever its use, will be unclean, whether it is made of wood cloth, hide or sack, cloth, put it in water, and it will be unclean until evening, and then it will be clean. If one of them falls into a clay pot, everything in it will be unclean, and you must break the pot. Any food that could be eaten but has water on it from such a pot is unclean, and any liquid that could be drunk from it is unclean. First off, isn't that just beautiful? (laughs) Don't you think, man, I need to text that to a friend. That will help them get through a tough time. Okay, get ready. I'm about to crack your tacos. What you just read has no place in Scripture. You say, what do you mean? What you just read is what any doctor will tell you is a pretty good description of germ theory. Germ theory? Oh, yeah. There was a man whose last name was Leuvenhock. I just love saying it. Leuvenhock was his last name. First name was Antonin. Antonin Leuvenhock in the 1600s came forward with a theory that you and I take for granted. Germ theory. That's why your mama, when there's a dead bird or a dead, you know, uh, rabbit in the road, and you as a kid ran up to touch it, she hollered what? Don't touch it, don't touch it. And if you touched it, oh no, we've got to wash your hands. Why? Germs. You're going to get germs on you. Do you realize, you and I grew up with that. 
Antonin Leeuwenhoek, when he introduced the idea, people went, what? I mean, I just see him telling all his German scientist friends, I think there's these little tiny things, <laughs> so small you cannot see them, and that's what makes you sick. It is said that one of the first doctors that really grabbed that theory and ran with it was his license was taken away because they said, you're nuts. <laughs> little tiny things. But then c- came along a guy named Louis Pasteur who proved it to people. And today we believe it. Problem. The text I just read you comes from a thousand plus years before Jesus. Mankind didn't even discover germ theory until nearly 2,000 years, 16, 17, 1800s after Jesus. How did germ theory... And, 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 and if you look at that passage, it's so wonderful because it even says... If something falls in that's unclean, touches the water, the water bounces out, touches something else, that's unclean. Now, folks, Moses was not CSI Sinai, all right? (laughs) He wasn't Louis Pasteur. And yet God placed there this unbelievable truth. Why? Well, first off, he was protecting the Israelites. But second off, I think he was giving you and I a little leg up when somebody says, well, the Bible's just a book. Really? Then tell me about this, because you won't find it in any other culture. Second, if the Bible is from God, I believe the Bible, if God wrote a book, it would be a global hit. You figure, if God wrote a book, it ought to sell, right? Would you agree with that? Well, let's see. Breaking Dawn, a Twilight book, sold 25 million copies. Pretty impressive, right? Harry Potter and the Deadly Hallows, 65 million. That is a popular book. You sell 65 million copies, that's a world bestseller. But there's some that are more than that. The Book of Mormon sold over 114 million copies when I did this research back in about 2009. And Lord of the Rings, 150 million copies. Don't hit it yet. If God wrote a book, wouldn't you expect it to be a global smash hit? When somebody says, I don't think the Bible's God's word. Okay, explain this to me, Lucy. Help me with this. If God wrote a book, you'd expect it to outsell everything else, right? Do you know that there were 500 million copies of the Bible sold in the year 1986? One year. Today, best guess, 7.1 billion copies of God's Word, New Testament, Old Testament, of God's Word out there, 7.1 billion copies, and that is a, is a conservative guess because there are more of these being printed, and when you start talking about Internet copies, all bets are off. I'm talking about the printed stuff. Praise God. Now, now somebody, I, I did the, gave this lecture someplace, and the guy said, yeah, right, sure. They said, here's the deal, man. That's that way because it's, a, it's, it's, it's an English book, okay? And it's, it's Western civilization. Okay, if it was a global hit, then it should be translated quite a bit, right? Um, Harry Potter's been translated into 64 different languages. Book of Mormon uh, has been translated into about 98 different languages the last time I looked. It's currently been translated into sections portions of God's Word into about 2,898 languages, and they're still working on it. Okay? So when somebody says, oh, the Bible's not God's Word, I just, I, I just ask them, well, help me with this then. Because if God had written a book, I'd expect it to be the head and shoulders bestseller, and I'd expect it to be a life changer. And that's the last note. It indeed is. Now, I was to talk about why we should believe in the church. And I want to close out with it maybe in a little different way than normal. Spoken word is a, is a form of poetry and prose put together. And I'm thankful to have a spoken word artist here today to close us with thank God for the church. Praise God for the cornerstone, the Christ, the one whose willing sacrifice paved a way for sinners like you and me. We broken vessels who've been redeemed. 
And sure, as a collective body, we are often bloodied and battered. Our attempts at unity are more scattered than gathered. Our wedding dress, a mess of tears and tatters. But Christ in us is the one who matters. For despite our many faults, despite our selfish default, despite the enemy's assaults, Christ has done a work through his church. You may have forgotten how the begotten's bride turned the tide time and again. You may have forgotten, but let me remind you when. Let me remind you when Roman parents saw no worth in warped figure or frame. They'd leave defective infants to die, but then the Christians came. These adopting Jesus lovers saw in every rescued child a value divine and inherent. So the name they claimed was Godparents. Let me remind you when illiteracy was part and parcel, when those who could read were a marvel. Who was it that founded the first academy? Who was it that started the first elementary? It was not a monarch or a politician. It was the monks and priests who served in missions. And now the Christ-born revolution of public education is any parent's bottom-rung expectation. Let me remind you when the plague, the bubonic, careened over Europe, unbridled and chronic. Who was it that opened the first hospital rooms? Who was it that served in that hell-raising doom? It was not a governing power responding in earnest. It was the people of Christ, the suffering servant. Let me remind you. Let me remind you when slavery was rampant. When people were property for the privileged and ruthless. You may have thought that those who fought against it were just moral. But the truth is, they were Christian brothers and sisters in arms. Who would no longer suffer the harm being done to generations untold. These Jesus lovers were bold as they stood for what's right. Risking their lives to say bond or free. We are one in Christ. Let me remind you. Let me remind you when freedom meant something very different depending upon your race or pigment. Long before a black president, back when black and white were segregated and the tension was like a knife serrated, cutting through communities and cities, tearing a nation apart and breaking God's heart. But when a massive march began and a speech rang out through the entire land, it was not a congressman whose voice boomed to the bleachers. It was a pastor, a preacher who dreamed of a day when this nation would make way for a kingdom-minded polity. And then that man was martyred for the sake of God-implanted equality. Now, I'm not trying to say that the church is perfect, but I believe with all my heart that she is worth it. For it is in spite of us that Christ is a light in us. That's why we sing it in our songs. In our weakness, he is strong. In our adopted grace, he gives us a place to belong. And in our frailty, he prevails over every wrong. So wherever the church has been, wherever the bride of Christ is coming from, if it is Jesus who leads us, though we stumble and fall, we humble our hearts and submit to the one and only Lord of all.